So this is my introduction to Kubernetes. So I, um, we people have been poking at it. It's been around for a couple years now, and it's starting to get to the point where many of us are getting forced to deal with it. <laughs> okay. Well, introduction to K8S. It's people keep call, keep people tend to call it K8S because three characters is much shorter than it's long to type. Um, I'm going to do a brief intro to the sorts of components that, that there are in Kubernetes. Um, talk a little bit about the progression of evolution of services. I have some crazy batch jobs that, that give some more stories that probably are really the interesting part. And then some pointers to tools that were somewhat useful to me and maybe useful to others. So originally, Kubernetes was a Google project called Borg. And this is, of course, the Star Trek race of critters. Um, and it's all about orchestrating the running of services inside containers. And like Google has bazillions of servers in lots of places, and they've got they need to run machines to do all kinds of little things, and they need thousands and thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of them. So robots running services, they don't want humans having to go in and type in command lines to make things run. Thousands and thousands of them with su sub-services, sub-sub-services, and how many subs do you want? Um, they need to be launched automatically, relaunched on failure. So some notion of self-monitoring. That's uh, uh, they need. They're then spread across a series of Borg cubes. I mean Kubernetes cubes. Um, if one cube gets blown up by the Federation, you've got more left. If you have connectivity problems, there's more left. There's more in some place where they're working better. Now, Kubernetes is actually a Greek word that means something between helmsman and pilot. It's um, a little ambiguous that way. Whomever it is that steers a ship. It uses Docker, usually, although that's becoming untrue. Um, that's the opposite side to things. And we, we've had some talks about Docker, and people have been poking at Docker. Um, you start with a container system. Well, there's a whole bunch of them that have been growing out. Docker was the initial one, and that kind of is the, uh, that it's really definitional in providing syntax and tooling for describing well, what is the virtual machine that you want to deploy in quantities of bazillions. But there's various, 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 various things. Containerd, Cryo, RTKlet, Fracky, AWS Firecracker, Gvisor. There's just lots. There's lots, and there's there's sort of a standard for. There's a standard that has been developed as to how these are to be communicated with, and how, the, what you need to implement to have a compatible container system. And if we if if we went there, well, there's a world there, and we've had some talks about that world. Forget about that world. That's really just the starting point. They then have major components that get in your face. Etc. D is a distributed key value store um, where configuration will reside. You probably you don't want it to, to treat it as if it's a relational database. You don't want to treat it as if, if you've got 10,000 pieces of configuration, you're probably doing it wrong. But people probably are doing it anyways. Um, there's a DNS server. This automatically manages host names because you're going to have a zillion cubelets running, running along, and each one of them is going to have IP addresses, and you don't want to remember IP addresses you want to point to DNS names uh, for your services. So the DNS service automatically provisions DNS um, for you inside, the, uh, inside a cube. There's a cube proxy because 
you probably want your service to be accessible from somewhere outside of Kubernetes. It's, if it's just inwards facing, then you've got this, you've got, well, like the, the Borg cubes don't need to talk to anybody, but actually they sometimes do. So a cube proxy sets up the network rules so that your wonderful service is accessible. There are less visible components. There's an API server used to control activities inside that tell the cubes what to do. There's a cube scheduler, launches and destroys pods. Right there you get some of the high availability. The scheduler means that if a pod goes down, we can now think about having another cube started to replace it. Node controller monitors each node to say, am I alive? This is starting to be the important stuff about it. Kubernetes isn't a container system, it's a monitoring system, a system to apply policy to the deployment of containers. Uh, replication controller is sort of a specialized thing for saying, I want to have seven DNS servers, I want to have five web servers and three of something else based on policy, adding and dropping pods. Endpoint controllers, this is a, endpoints are a big thing these days in web services, connecting pods together to form logical sets of services. And the point of the Kubernetes is to monitor in the, to have the clusters be self-monitoring, self-administering. Um, you wind up writing up a lot of policy to describe how you want things shaped. There is a progression of various sorts of services. The simplest thing, the, the thing you get a lot of, are pods. A pod consists of a set of related containers. It's not just one container, or it, it might be one container, but maybe multiples because they share an IP address and you may want to have them share storage. Well, they share an IP address, they share storage. You may want to put some things close together, like log aggregators that will forward things over to another server later. There's a kind of, you might define a pod as being a cron job. So every hour you run this pod. It launches, does something, generates a report, sends it to somebody, dies, restarts. This is very much like cron, this, it's called cron job. We know what cron jobs are, generally speaking. Jobs is just run a thing once, more or less. Um, a daemon set says, well, if you've got a cluster con consisting of a bunch of servers, we want to have a particular pod on each server. So maybe it's about this log aggregation. We have each pod does, each, each uh, no, yeah, each pod has a log aggregator. It forwards it to the log aggregator that's the daemon set, and then that forwards to a centralized instance of, say, Elasticsearch. You have things that are crossed out. Replication controllers were the first version of, I want to have seven of this. Replica sets were a further version of this, and they're not quite dead, but they're smelling funny, because what you actually want to use these days is a deployment. A deployment will, be, will, tell you, will describe the shape of a set of pods, some of them, uh, some of them that you want multiple of. So the deployment will be, I want to deploy a database server. I want to deploy my application, which consists of some message queuing pods, some web server pods, this and that. And you put the, pol the policy as to how many of them you, you want to have goes in the, um, in the deployment set. So that's, it's a progression towards more sophisticated things. Uh, stateful set, it needs stateful, it needs um, stable network or storage. 
There's more sophisticated services called operators. Think of it as a system operator responsible for operating everything about a service. So a Postgres operator, multiple replica nodes using replication, knows how to do backups, knows how to do failover, automated recovery, uh, maybe you're managing users and, and permissions, a capability to scale up by cloning uh, the cluster, PG bouncer to do connection pooling, health monitoring, and it's, that's, there's a whole bunch of these um, that are growing. YAML, YAML everywhere. There's manifests as to how the pods in, for your services are configured. These are written in YAML. It's, there's configuration you'll pass to the pods, also YAML. You're in a maze of twisty YAMLs, all nearly the same. I'd like an engine for generating this. There's engines for generating this. Yet another something language, markup language. I don't know, I don't know. Configuration panes, well, it's a twisty set of YAML. Environment variable overlay. Don't call, if, if your environment depends on certain names, don't call your configuration parameters by those names. Copy them over. Um, because this is like running things inside a cron job. My journey was I built shell scripts doing database work. This isn't a great fit for being an endpoint or a service or a bunch of these things. The best fit seems to be jobs. Um, I have a bunch of job steps. I was thinking maybe I would define 20 or 30 jobs. But it turns out that's not the best fit because <laughs> there is no dependency system, no indication that this is, an, uh, th is gonna change. So I wrote some shell, shell scripts, job controller. A job controller is, uh, and I, I set up two dozen containers in my pod. There's about 23 or 24 containers. And, they, um, and I have one of, one of the containers manages the others. Hooray. It's got 22 containers, a lot of YAML, a lot of containers. It doesn't work very hard, though. There's notes. Hooray. Um, Helm is a package for manager for Kubernetes, so you implement a chart that's a bunch of pods. It lets you deploy locally custom configuration that then gets attached to a chart and then he comprises a release of it. There's a templating system based on Go templates to let you mix your configuration with some defaults because a lot of times you don't care about changing things. A requirements document lets you say, we need, to, we need a bunch more charts. There is some support for automatically doing upgrades to your software. There's a barrel load of shell tools that are probably really pretty useful. Um, hooray, command completion is built in, compatible with Bash and Zed Shell. Um, there's a curses thing, command line interface help. You'll be managing many clusters and many namespaces and jumping between them is useful. Uh, put, your Q, put your Kubernetes configuration into your prompt because it's, because and then there's, uh, there's some Emacs stuff. You can have a Kubernetes buffer in Emacs, ah, which is on the next page as well. And there's Kubernetes and Helm stuff. Hooray. And that's it. <laughs>